what I'm going to do is actually start you out with this page. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go into this one to the second page. which has this on it. I don't know. I don't like the way the, the book has this flowing. So I'm just going to kind of jump around between the two packets just a little bit here at the beginning. <clears throat> we already talked a little bit about electronegativities um, in one of the previous day, days. And we talked about not having an electronegativity table, but generally knowing that as you go up and to the right, Electronegativities increase, fluorine being a 4.0 at the highest. As you go down and away from that, they tend to uh, decrease. Hydrogen's kind of a lower end one, two, being further to the left. Um, let's look a little bit more at that. Pure covalent bonding, in which atoms share an electron pair equally, occurs only when two atoms that are identical are bonded. When two dissimilar atoms form a covalent bond, the electron pair will be unequally shared. This results in a polar covalent bond. A bond in which the two atoms have partial charges Positive dipole and a negative dipole. Bonds are polar because not all atoms hold on to their valence electrons with the same force, nor do atoms take on additional electrons with equal ease. If a bond pair is not equally shared between atoms, the bonding electrons are nearer to one of the atoms. The atom toward which the bond is displaced has a larger share of the electron pair and thus acquires a partial negative charge. The atom at the other end of the bond is depleted in electrons and the bond between the two atoms has a positive end and a negative end, that is positive and negative poles or dipoles. The bond is called a polar bond and the molecule is said to be dipolar. In ionic compounds, the displacement of the bonding pair to one of the two atoms is essentially complete, and we get full plus one and minus one symbols, or full charges, written alongside the atoms as they become ions. For polar covalent bonds, the polarity is indicated by writing the symbols delta positive and delta negative alongside the side of the atom symbol. The delta symbol stands for dipole or partial charge. So it's the lower case Greek letter delta that we're using for dipole. Just to uh, compare and contrast a little bit here, if we looked at lithium fluoride, which is an ionic bond, the lithium would acquire an electron from, the fluorine would acquire an electron from lithium, become a negative one ion with a full negative one charge. And the lithium atom would become the lithium plus one ion, naked of its valence electrons and carries a full positive charge. So full ionic charges with ionic compounds. Plus one, plus two, plus three, negative three, negative two, negative one, whatever it might be. If you look at a nonpolar molecule like hydrogen bonded to hydrogen, because they have equal electronegativities on both atoms, they're pulling on those electrons, that shared pair of electrons equally. And uh, no dipoles exist in this case. It's a nonpolar molecule or a non dipole molecule. But then in HCl, covalently bonded, but the atoms aren't equal. So the electrons are being pulled towards one side over the other. 
And for that, we'd have to look at their electronegativities a little bit and see that the electrons are being pulled towards the chlorine side of this molecule. So we'd indicate that with either a negative and positive dipole like that, or an alternate way of showing that might be to draw an arrow, the plus sign at the positive end of the molecule, showing that the electrons are spending more time with the chlorine. In the 1930s, the famous American chemist Linus Pauling proposed a parameter called the electronegativity that allows us to decide whether a bond is polar, which atom is negative, which atom is positive, and whether one of the bonds is more polar than another. Um, electronegativity of an atom is defined as the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. So how good is the atom at pulling electrons away from other atoms towards itself? And we're once again familiar with the uh, table. And for the most part, you're only worrying about when we're doing covalent bonding, those things to the right of the staircase and hydrogen. I suppose if you're doing ionic bonding, then I, you would cross the line, but Ionic bonds are pretty easy to figure out. Metals and nonmetals make ionic compounds. You know, usually have to look at electronegativities to figure that out. If you have a small difference in your chemical bond between two atoms, somewhere between, for example, zero and 0 0.3. Um, if you got a small electronegativity difference, maybe, for example, if you had bromine bonded to iodine electronegativity difference of uh, 0.3 there, or maybe chlorine connected to bromine, difference of 0.2. If the electronegativity difference is really small, essentially there's no winner, a strong winner in the tug of war, and we would consider that to be a nonpolar covalent bond. We'd say that the ionic character for that is low. Ionic character is just basically measuring how uneven the electrons are being shared between, between two things. The more uneven you are, the more ionic you're behaving. Of course, all diatomics, um, like fluorine, F2, Cl2, O2, N2, all your diatomics have a zero electronegativity difference, and they're essentially perfect sharers of electrons. Polar covalent is what we get from 0 0.4 to 1.7, pretty big, pretty big range of electronegativity differences, where we get 6 to 50 percent, 6 percent to 50 percent ionic character. Bigger electronegativities, more polar covalent it becomes, and uh, the stronger the dipoles would become, the stronger those partial charges would be. And if you're over 50% in your ionic character for a 1.8 to about a 3.2, I think 3.2 is the biggest difference you can have. That's like 51% to 92% ionic. That means you've crossed the line, you're not sharing anymore, you're stealing electrons and taking on full ionic charges. So that's one way that we uh, kind of classify bonds. And the reason we start with this page is because we're gonna talk about the polarity of molecules. And the polarity of molecules is not the same as the polarity of a bond. Polarity of the bond is just looking at the electronegativities of two things and seeing if the two atoms that are connected to each other are sharing equally or not equally. Are the bonds nonpolar or polar, for example? That's one part of identifying polarity. But then we look at the polarity of a molecule as a whole, and we have to consider that next. Yes. So differences in electronegativities helps us determine the ionic polar and nonpolar nature of chemical bonds. But there's more to it than that. So now I'm going to have you jump to the other page.
We're going to look a little bit at molecular polarity. The term polar can be used to describe a bond in which one atom has a partial positive charge and the other has a partial negative charge. Because most molecules have polar bonds, molecules as a whole can also be polar. So the bonds can be polar, the molecules can be polar. In a polar molecule, electron density accumulates towards one side of the molecule, giving that side a negative charge, leaving the other side with a partial positive charge of equal value or equal magnitude. When placed in an electric field, polar molecules experience a force that tends to align them with the magnetic field. The extent to which the molecules line up with the field depends on the dipole moment or other polarity is distributed. So here we've got two diagrams. Uh, one on the left shows us, well, both show us that we got polar molecules. We can see that by the positive and negative dipoles. Here the uh, circuit is open and we do not have a magnetic field and the molecules seem to be randomly aligned. On the right, the circuit has been closed, the magnetic fields have been established, and we see they all snap to attention with the positive dipole attracted to the negative field and the negative dipole attracted to the positive field. So obviously, based on this drawing, molecules in this diagram are polar. We can tell that just by looking at the dipoles. The electric field is active in the diagram on the right. But if you put nonpolar molecules in this electric field, what would you expect to happen? Because nonpolar molecules don't have dipoles, they cancel each other out or they don't exist. Maybe it's a nonpolar bond and a nonpolar molecule, they would be randomly aligned, kind of like a magnet on aluminum. Magnets don't affect aluminum. Um, magnetic field is not going to affect a nonpolar molecule. So it's going to be no alignment. Ionics would snap to attention, you know, try to align themselves the best they could as well. If you had formula units in there, they have charges. The dipole moment measures the SI units for measuring dipole moments is the Coulomb meter, but traditionally dipole moments have been measured in a unit called the Debye. Listed are some common compounds and their dipole moments measured in Debye. So one of the things I noticed, for example, with HF, where I have a 2.1 with a 4.0 electronegativity, I got a big electronegativity difference and I get a stronger value for the dipole moment, the magnitude of those dipoles. Whereas here I got a 2.1 with a 3.0. It's not as intense. Like this is a 2.1 with like a 2.8. Not exactly sure what iodine is. Iodine is 2.5. So uh, as you have a smaller electronegativity difference, as you get closer to being nonpolar, your magnitude of the dipoles decreases. The bigger the electronegativity difference, the more magnitude. Here we've got um, nitrogen and boron both have three things attached to them. Um, but if you looked at the structure, the shape of the molecule, this one's got a lone pair, this one's got a lone pair, this one does not have lone pairs. And uh, the dipoles don't cancel on these two, and they've got their dipole moments, but they do cancel on this one. It was a nonpolar molecule as a whole. H2O and H2S both have the same shape, same number of lone pairs. They look exactly the same, except for the fact that one's got sulfur and one's got oxygen. But it's the electronegativity difference between the hydrogen and oxygen that makes this one really big. This is also why water can do hydrogen bonding as an intermolecular force, because it has a really strong dipole moment. 
And by the way, so can HF. This can make hydrogen bonds. This is capable of making hydrogen bonds. And uh, this one's capable of making hydrogen bonds because they got a really big electronegativity difference and they make really strong dipole moments. But we'll talk about hydrogen bonds in the next chapter, chapter 10. And then uh, this one's got a lone pair on the central atom. You don't see it there, but it's got a, a lone pair. So uh, this one's polar, but this one doesn't have any lone pairs and they cancel each other out. It's not polar. To predict whether a molecule is polar, we need to consider whether the molecule has polar bonds and how these bonds are positioned relative to one another based on the geometry or the shape of the molecule. Because knowing that the bonds are polar is one thing, but they could cancel each other out and make for a non-polar molecule. So that's what we're gonna do with this. We analyze the polarity of a molecule essentially the exact same way we do in first year chemistry. Um, we look for a couple attributes to figure out if it's polar or non-polar. Starting with CO2. So carbon dioxide looks like this. When we go to draw it, a double bond on both of the oxygens, get that. So then the next thing we look at is we just try to break down what's going on in there. And the first thing I always look at is what's the shape. It's a simple linear structure, straight line. The other thing I look for is, is there a variety around the central atom? Does it have symmetry or is it lopsided with asymmetry? So I look around this central atom and everything around the central atom is the same. The left of the molecule is the same as the right of the molecule. I guess you could say the top is the same as the bottom as well. This is a molecule that is symmetrical. Usually, Actually, I think you can say always. If there's no variety, and there is no variety around the central atom, no variety of objects attached to the central atom, Vesper is going to make it position itself symmetrically. Vesper model. So, uh, Vesper tells us that these two oxygens have to be on the opposite sides of each other. They want to minimize interference. Since there's no variety, they're going to take the opposite sides. That's going to lead to symmetry. The other thing I look for is um, polarity of the bonds. So if I got 3.5 electronegativities here and a 2.5 on the carbon, those are polar bonds. Difference is 1.0. So I've got polar bonds. Which means individually, electrons are being pulled away from the carbon towards the oxygen this way. Away from the carbon towards the oxygen this way. I guess I could kind of put that in there like this. But polarity of the bonds does not tell you the polarity of the molecule. So I look at this and I say, if you're pulling equally out to the left as you are to the right, dipoles of the polar bond cancel out. They cancel each other. And overall, this turns into a non-polar molecule. So we have polar bonds and a non-polar molecule overall. And if it's non-polar, I normally don't put electronegativities on there. I don't put the arrows on there because they're going to cancel each other out. It just clutters up the drawing. Um, usually, I'm thinking in my head. You know, this is shape, probably had to write that down anyway. I'm asking myself, does it have symmetry? Does it have variety? And it's got symmetry and no variety. It's going to be non-polar. In contrast, if we look at water, we 
I like to draw it the way it looks. Water doesn't have straight lines in it anywhere. So. Water looks more like this than left, right, top, and bottom. There is no straight line anywhere in there. And even if I move this hydrogen and swap it out with one of these lone pairs, you get back right to the exact same structure again. Got the tetrahedral base. Um, 109.5 degree bond angles, but the two lone pairs compress that by about two and a half degrees each. So it's about 105 degree bond angles here. So I'm going to write down first there's a bent two shape molecule. Two is optional. If I look at variety around the central atom, not everything around the central atom is the same. I got lone pairs and I have atoms, which makes this asymmetrical. Often, when you have lone pairs on the central atom, that in itself is going to push things into the polar category for the molecule. If I look at the bonds, 2.1, 2.1, 3 3.5 up here, these are polar bonds. But because it's asymmetrical and it's lopsided, nothing's going to offset the direction of the, uh, the dipoles. They're not going to cancel. And for that reason, it's going to be a polar bond. And being a polar molecule, then I should label where the positive and negative dipoles are. So do that yellow. I could do it this way, saying that the hydrogen side of the molecule is the positive end and the oxygen side is the negative end. Or I could do it. With a positive dipole, positive dipole, and negative dipole above. Usually you don't do both because that gets a little bit messed up, but one or the other, you got to indicate the dipoles on a polar molecule. Down below, we got a couple examples of what's going on. Uh, here's a water molecule. One of the things you're going to notice that the textbook likes to do is they like to quantify the magnitude of the dipoles. Positive and negative have to cancel each other out. Um, so if you have two positive dipoles with the hydrogen, then the magnitude of the negative dipole and the oxygen should be twice that so that it cancels itself out. But it is a charged molecule because those dipoles exist. They put the uh, arrow down the middle just kind of showing which end is positive and which is negative. I usually do it off to the side so you can see what the drawing is. And then they've got this thing called an electrostatic diagram, electrostatic potentials. And uh, blue indicates the positive end, red indicates the negative end. 
and they're kind of just showing you how that charge field distributes itself around the molecule. With the uh, CO2, I don't love this diagram. I mean, it is a polar bond, but it's a nonpolar molecule. They cancel. And uh, the thing I don't like about this one is it kind of makes it seem like there's a negative end, a negative end, and a positive in the middle. And they should be more negated than I think this diagram shows. And it's kind of bothering me. So I went and I looked at another diagram that has this, which that PHET website. Where did I have that? And uh, I have this one linked to your um, syllabus, but they have a PHET for um, polarity as well as shapes. And you can pick your molecules if you want, uh, or you can play around with making your own molecule. You can increase the electronegativity of one and decrease the other and see how it changes the, uh, the whole thing. Okay, whatever. Um, but I just wanted to look at a real molecule. So here's like water, for example. I like this better because they just use kind of two colors and okay, definitely a red end and a blue end to this. And if I switch it over to carbon dioxide, well, that doesn't look that much better than I thought. Um, looks, it looks more diffuse on my screen. Uh, but they've really softened up where this negative dipole is. They've really kind of negated a lot of that negative charge in the center. And this is on my screen more towards the middle as well. So this is just basically all muted colors of red and blue, not as pronounced as something as you would have, for example, with water, or you definitely got a red and a blue side. But it's kind of a, Nice, you can do it by a variety of things. You can look at the uh, electron density because that's essentially what's going on. The electronegativities are telling you where the electrons are being pulled. Well, we got a greater electron density on the oxygen, lesser electron density on the hydrogens. You know, I did that also with like the CO2, maybe that will look better, I don't know. You know, we don't get the dark black on both sides. It's just kind of like almost an even gray somewhere in the middle, all the way across. Um, but you can do um, their electronegativities, they give you those down there. You can do the partial charges. If you wanna figure out what the Debye are and things like that, do the arrow with the dipole, individual bonds with the dipoles. All that kind of stuff. If you need to visualize it better. Take a look at a couple others. Um, HCl, easy to draw. Two atom molecules are quick and simple. When it's a two atom molecule, the polarity of the bond will tell you the polarity of the molecule. So you could just look at the electronegativities here and figure out real quick that this is a polar bond and therefore this is a polar molecule. Um, I don't know if the other information is really helpful. Anything might be distracting. It's a simple linear structure. Uh, I don't know if I would even like talk about variety around the central atom because there's not a central atom in particular. If there was, I guess it would be chlorine. I don't know, but it's asymmetrical because the left is not the same as the right. It's lopsided from that point of view. Um, polar bonds and the dipoles don't cancel each other out. So it's a polar molecule. Polar. 
So we could do that, or we could do that. But don't do both. So sometimes a polar bond doesn't mean it's a polar molecule. Sometimes it doesn't. For example, on my methane, a little bit tetrahedral like. Tetrahedral, four things attached to it, 109.5 degree bond angles. If I look at electronegativity, 0.1 all around, middle, which does give me polar bonds because the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is 0.4. But I have symmetry. There's no variety. When there's symmetry and no variety, it will always be non-polar, even if you have polar bonds. Because the dipoles will cancel. So this is a non-polar molecule. be a nonpolar molecule if the dipoles cancel each other out. So symmetry and lack of variety always cancels out dipoles. Here we got the uh, HCl, dark blue, dark red. I don't know what the yellow is doing there on the end, but uh, I find them looking prettier than they are useful. Probably a bad joke in there somewhere, right? Um, negative and positive, positive and negative, I mean. And then here, you got the polar bonds. They're not very strong dipoles to begin with. And then they're negated by, they're negating each other and the colors just kind of become muted. I think that's what you're supposed to see. With SO3, <laughs> if you have double bonds and single bonds, in this case, resonance for Mr. Goldman. I caught one of those suckers this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Like a trap. Oh, I know. Molecular model. We're doing shapes. They were given to us about six months ago and they finally arrived. <laughs> they rattle. I wish I could play with that. Seems like I have a lot of them. Phoenix. Zeus. All right. Um, We got a resonating structure here, double bonds, single bonds. Double bonds and single bonds do not give you variety around the central atom. That's not considered to be variety. It's the objects that are attached to the central atom. All the atoms are the same. There's no variety. If there was a lone pair in there on the central atom, that would be variety. If one of the atoms was different than the others, that would be variety. But single bonds and double bonds do not consider, are not considered variety. So we got a Trigonal planar, 120 
degree bond angles all the way around. Um, symmetry. These are equal in all directions, it's equally spaced and all that kind of good stuff. Um, because there is no variety. Well, variety means it's gonna be symmetrical. Um, polar bonds, I believe, 3.5. Well, first gonna be like a 2.8 maybe, 2.5. It's a really good question. It's a really good question. I don't know. I haven't looked at the test for a while. Are we going to have to memorize the word symbol? No. Generally speaking, if they're not two atoms that are identical to each other, you look at it and you like say it's probably a polar bond. Further up and to the right. It's going to be the negative one. Further down to the left, it's going to be the positive one in the bond. Um, that's what they would expect you to do in the AP exam. Now, if I want to get into like finer details, I think the electric activities are nice. And sometimes they want to get into finer details on the AP exam. Those cases, they might include them in the problem. So, but they don't give you a, a table overall. Um, symmetrical, no variety. That means even though it's all polar bonds, they cancel. Because you have polar bonds does not necessarily mean you have a polar molecule. SiCl4 is almost not worth doing, but I'll just put it down real quick. I'll cancel out for non polar molecules. Again, those polar bonds are canceling out based on their position, their shape relative to each other, as dictated by the Vesper model. So here they do that thing. They show where they would be. I don't necessarily like that. There seems to be pretty dark red ends and a blue center. Maybe because you can't get to the center. Maybe that's, I don't know. But it's a non-polar molecule overall. Fortunately, they can't use those diagrams on the AP exam because A, it's not in color, and B, you can't draw that with a black pen. Um, and then NH3, very commonly used example, ammonia. It has variety because it's got atoms and lone pairs. It's asymmetrical. That lone pair makes it lopsided, typically. That's what happens when you have polar pairs. It makes you lopsided. Bonds are polar. Two 
3.1 and a 3.0. But the molecule is also polar because of the asymmetry. Polar bonds do not cancel each other out. And you get a net pull on this one, uh, in this case, going towards the nitrogen. So I might do an arrow off to the side like this, or do three positive partial charges and a negative partial charge on the nitrogen. Kind of like what they did right below it here. The other thing I don't like about this electrostatic diagram is to me, that looks pretty muted down there. Like, that doesn't look very positively charged, dark blue. That's kind of a pretty weak red as well. Yet I know this is a strongly polar molecule because it's capable of making hydrogen bonds for intermolecular forces. It's a very strong dipole. So I'm not, I'm not loving the electrostatic diagrams that they got in here. Their colors are not working well for them. Their graphic artists may be lacking. We skip. Oops. That's a bit. Clean on. Uh, lone pair wise. Noble gas is probably going to be an exception to the octet rule with extra electrons. The general rule of thumb is if you have extra electrons, put them on the central atom in pairs. So if we go through our mental checklist, um, this is linear. Kind of a complex version of linear, but the atoms will be in a straight line to each other. Kind of looking like that. Um, there is variety. Then we got to ask ourselves, is there symmetry? <laughs> Look in your face. Um, this has symmetry. Top's the same as the bottom. So think about it this way. The atoms are on opposite sides. They're going to pull opposite of each other. So it's like a tug of war in a straight line. And then whatever the lone pairs are doing, Let's, they don't have an electronegativity, but let's say they're all pulling. It's a three-way tug of war, equal in all directions. They're going to cancel each other out. Or if they're pushing in on each other, they're going to cancel each other out. This is a three-way shoving match then. And, you know, it is kind of like the top's the same as the bottom, the middle planes even all the way across, being planar and such. So we have kind of a disguise difficult to find at least symmetrical nature to it. You gotta watch out for that. A variety and symmetry usually don't go together. But when you got a noble gas as a central atom, it's probably gonna happen because noble gases are weird. Because of the symmetry, the polar bonds. Are going to cancel, and it's a non-polar molecule. Usually, variety does, but 
but you're gonna see with two examples of uh, noble gases, the noble gases tend to um, position their atoms in a symmetrical way and their lone pairs in a symmetrical way that they take that variety and make it symmetrical. I guess symmetry outdoes variety, yeah. And since we're talking about noble gases, let's take a look at krypton tetrafluoride. Fluorine's all around. Lots of electrons to work with. More than enough electrons to work with. So we put the extra pairs on the central atom. And we get a square planar. Shape. So atom wise, square plane, flat. This one cancels out this one. This one cancels out this one. And they want to be as far apart from each other as possible because they're more repulsive. So they take the opposite ends. And they, whether they're pulling against each other or pushing on each other, they're doing it equally. And again, we've got kind of a, we've got variety. But I would argue that there's symmetry here. And we got polar bonds. Um, this is pretty common with the two shapes, the complex linear shape and the square planar shape, which are typically found when you have noble gas as a central atom. So I just was watch out for those. Again, the symmetry outweighs the variety. So watch out for those. And then last one here. When a halogen is a central atom, it often exceeds the octet rule. Extra electrons just go in the central atom, so it's easy to figure out where they're going to go. There is variety, but it is asymmetrical. The left and the right kind of mostly probably negate each other, but there's nothing to offset that fluorine on the bottom. Polar bonds. And uh, this is a polar bond too. I'm usually tempted to just try to get away with drawing an arrow with that one. You know, the bottom of the molecule, you definitely have to have electrons accumulated on that bottom half of that molecule where that fluorine is. I'm a little bit, I find it a little bit um, sketchy to label them as individual dipoles because that's what it looks like. You got the two lone pairs on the top. For the most part, this is going to cancel out this, I would think, because they're almost straight across, but they are on a slight angle because these are going to compress that by about 
somewhere between four and six degrees. So, okay, these are pulling a little bit down. So there'll be a little bit of a charge on these, but definitely nothing to offset this one. So I'm expecting just kind of like, if I was looking at the colors, kind of like a weak blue to a dark blue at the bottom, back to a weak blue on the sides, and then just a red area on the top of this molecule. I don't know. I don't know how strong those are on the left and the right, but. I don't know, I guess. I just think the left and the right are gonna mostly cancel each other out. But we don't have a whole lot of way of quantifying that without getting into uh, measurements of Dubai, which actually get that information to work with. So gotta be able to analyze a molecule. And one of the things you can do in your assignment is go through and identify the polarity of everything. Um, you probably already drawn the shape or the molecule for Lewis structure. You probably already identified the shapes if you're keeping up with things. Now you can go back and do the polarity. Every time it's a polar molecule, you gotta label the dipoles. If it's nonpolar, you don't label the dipoles. Um, but you'll always be asked to put the dipoles on polar molecules. Then to finish things up today, I wanna to go back to the sheet that we started with all the way to the front. And look at formal charges and see how that connects in some decision making and how it might relate to polarity as well. Formal charges is something that you have not done before. And it's something that can be used to help you figure out if your structure is the right structure or the wrong structure. So it's a way of evaluating a Lewis structure or comparing two Lewis structures to figure out which one's better and which one's worse. You won't understand what it is until you get to the last page, but let's just start with this. Lewis structures generally provide a fairly good picture of bonding and covalently bonded molecules. It is possible to fine tune this picture, however, to get a more precise description of the distribution of electrons. Closer analysis of covalently bonded molecules reveals that the valence electrons are not distributed among the atoms as evenly as the Lewis structure might suggest. Some atoms may have a slightly negative charge, others might have a slightly positive charge. And this situation occurs because the electron pair or pairs of a given bond may be drawn more strongly toward one atom than another. The way the electrons are distributed in the molecule is called the charge distribution, which results in a dipole moment. We've already looked at that kind of stuff today. The charge distribution affects the properties of the molecule, characteristics such as polarity, intermolecular forces of attraction, melting points and boiling points are all related to the charge distribution or the polarity of the molecule. And uh, intermolecular forces and changes of state will be a part of chapter 10. So formal charges. The formal charge of an atom in a molecule or an ion is a charge calculated for that atom based on the Lewis structure of the molecule or ion using the following equation. It looks complicated, but that's just because they don't have a single variable. Every textbook describes this a little differently with different values. They're just using acronyms here. The formal charge of the atom is gonna be the valence electrons that the atom brings into it, based on what column number it's in on the periodic table, minus the sum of the lone pair electrons in the Lewis structure on that atom, plus one half of the bonding electrons on that atom in the Lewis structure. And that will give us a number. It's usually a small number. You can do all this just with mental math. You don't need a calculator for it. The sum of formal charges on the atom in a molecule or ion always equals the net charge on the molecule or ion. So in a molecule, the formal charges that you calculate for each element, for each atom in the structure should all add up to zero. In a mm -hmm. polyatomic ion like hydroxide, the sum of the formal charges should add up to be the charge that you would normally see associated with 
that polyatomic ion. Sum of formal charges zero for neutral molecules, sum of formal charges the same as the polyatomic ion if you're doing it for a polyatomic ion. So what you see here is how they calculated. Oxygen brings in from the periodic table six valence electrons. We subtract how many lone pair electrons plus half of the bonding pair of electrons. So half of the two electrons that's being bonded. And we find out that there's a formal charge of negative one on the oxygen. We do the same thing for the hydrogen. It brings in one electron. There's no lone pairs. Half of the bonding pair gives us a charge of zero. What that's essentially telling us is that in the hydroxide ion, the negative charge is going to be associated with the oxygen, where it should be. It's more electronegative. And that's form formalizing it, I guess. But um, that's one way of using some of that information. Ultimately, that's not the main thing we're doing with it, though. In the hydroxide ion, the oxygen can lay claim to seven electrons, six lone pair electrons, and one bonding electron. So the atom of oxygen has a formal charge of negative one. The oxygen has formally gained an electron as being part of the hydroxide ion. Looking at a couple other examples, we look at nitrate. If we go through and do the If we look at the oxygens, we have two different types of oxygens, oxygens that are single bonded and oxygens that are double bonded. So uh, if I do the single bond oxygen, that's going to be six electrons that it brings in. six electrons for the lone pairs and one half of the two electrons there's an extra bracket that's going to come out to be negative one so it's um, negative one negative one on that one and that one the double bonded oxygen would have six electrons that it brings into the structure. It has four lone pair electrons and one half of the bonding pair. There's four electrons bonded. Six minus six, that's going to be at zero. And nitrogen should also be calculated. Like one of those. It has five valence electrons, no lone pair electrons. Um, and one half of the bonding pair of electrons is eight. So that's going to be a plus one. If I add up all the formal charges on those four atoms, I come up with a negative one, which makes sense. The sum of the formal charges should be negative one, just like it is here. And um, it suggests that some of these oxygens have formally gained an electron. Some have formally lost an electron. But this one actually resonates. So it's not really um, a formal charge of one, zero, and one. It's actually a formal charge of negative two thirds on all of the oxygens because the double bond is actually resonating, which just makes that example more complicated. do this, it's pretty easy to calculate the hydrogens. In this structure, they come out to be zero for each one. 
and the nitrogen calculated comes out to be plus one, which makes sense um, based on the fact that the formal charge of the ion has to match the formal or the charge of the polyatomic ion. And if we did this, we would see zero, zero, and zero for the formal charges. And that adds up to zero, which makes sense because it should be zero if you're talking about a neutral molecule like carbon dioxide is. So that by itself just seems like calculating numbers for no reason, probably. Let's make you see what the reason for doing this is on, skip a page, this page. Using formal charge calculations alone to lo locate the site of a charge in an ion can sometimes lead to results that seem incorrect. To resolve this dilemma, we must consider electronegativity in conjunction with formal charge. Linus Pauling pointed out two basic guidelines to use when describing charge distributions in molecules and ions. The first is the electronegativity. Uh, electroneutrality principle, which declares that electrons will be distributed in such a way that the formal charges on all atoms are as close to zero as possible. If you draw a structure one way and all the numbers are close to zero, and you draw it another way and you see that the formal charges are greater numbers, you always wanna go with the one that's as close to zero as possible. We'll see that with this next example. The other point is that if a negative charge is present, it should reside on the most electronegative atoms. So if you, for example, have a polyatomic ion and there's a negative charge, it's drawn correctly if the negative charge is on the most electronegative atom which in itself is kind of important too. So using that idea, let's look at electronegativity and formal charge to look at two structures, two different ways we could potentially draw carbon dioxide. We could balance it out, make a double bond on each side, which is what we normally would tell you to do. I always say make single bonds first, upgrade to double bonds if you have to, save triple bonds only if you need them, absolutely need them. Both of these would be considered resonance structures. Um, resonance hybrids is we're not moving the atoms, we're just moving the electrons. But just because you can draw a resonance structure for it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do it. If we look at um, this one, when we calculate the electro, uh, the formal charge of each one, this one goes more towards the electro neutrality. They're all zero. The molecules charge is zero as well. You're not going to do much better than that. That's what the structure will want to do as far as electron distribution. Whereas if you look at this one, it still adds up to zero, but we're further away from zero for this neutral molecule, indicating that there's a not as much electroneutrality as we should have. This one is more electroneutral. This is the one that we should be trying to If you follow all the rules that we've kind of put in place in the past, chances are you can be just drawn it correctly anyhow. A lot of those 
John Hur's helpful hints and things like that are designed so you wouldn't have to do formal charges to get the right answer. But A is the more stable, more satisfactory structure based on formal charges in that case. If we do formal charges with this one, it's got a polyatomic ion. You would have do it a single bond and a triple bond. Like that. Double bond, double bond, like that. And triple bond, single bond. And they're all a polyatomic ion, so they should all have a bracket. So again, these are considered to be resin hybrids um, because you got the same atoms, same connections, but we're just drawing them differently with the octet rule and where the double bonds and triple bonds and all that kind of stuff should be. With the single bond, double bond, triple bond order, you would think. But in this case, it's showing us that if we follow the electron neutrality principle, first off, we want to eliminate this one. The, chart, the numbers are too big. They're not as close to zero as possible. That's not a good option. Then we got these two to choose from. Both of them have low numbers, equally low for their formal charges. So good from that point of view, same electro neutrality. But the second thing that we have to look at is the, uh, the other point on that page. If the negative charge is present, it should reside on the most electronegative atom. So there is a negative charge present and the most electronegative atom in this structure is the oxygen. So because of this and the great electronegativity here, it turns out that A is the best structure. Let me phrase, phrase it at. Um, most electro, well, equal to uh, be in terms of electron neutrality, but it has the negative charge in the right location as well. So that's the best option, which doesn't go with the normal guidelines that we would see. You don't have to do formal charges on every structure, but they will specifically ask you to use formal charges from time to time. And it would be something perhaps like this, where you've got two or maybe three structures, and you're asked to pick which one is the best structure based on the use of formal charges. I'm calculating the formal charges using that equation here. I'm just not showing the calculation each time because it's tedious. Let's do it this one. I'll show the calculations for this one. We're going to want to analyze two structures for um, sulfate. I don't have the structures drawn completely yet, so I have to draw them first. And uh, let's say you had this one. This is the standard that everybody would draw. If you didn't know any better, why wouldn't you? I mean, 32 electrons give everybody octet. Makes perfect sense to do it that way. Um, and if I did the numbers on this one for the oxygen, same, we'd have six, low, uh, six uh, valence electrons that we bring in, six bonding, or excuse me, six lone pair electrons, and then one half of the bonding electrons. I'm just going to say that's one. That would give us the negative one. And then if we do the sulfur in the middle, usually I just do the bonding, half the bonding pairs in the head. I don't 
I would say uh, six zero lone pairs, eight electrons, one half of that would be four. So we're going to get a plus two on that. So negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, plus two. Add up to negative two, that's good. Um, the negative charge is on the more electronegative element, which is the oxygen, so that's reasonable. But what if it was going this way? That's going to be the same as this. Uh, six minus six plus one is negative one. Then got the double bonded oxygen. And that's going to be six valence electrons, zero lone pair electrons, and one half of two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve would be six. That's going to be zero. And if you do the sulfur, you have six valence electrons that are brought in. You have zero lone pairs. And again, you would also do one half of 12 with that to zero. Which means you could have zero, 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 negative one, negative one. Based on electron neutrality, this one's closer to zero. adds up to negative two. Technically, that's the better structure. And by the way, it resonates. Um, that's a good question. Why did I do that? Or, oh. I don't know what I was thinking. I was counting them all up. I was, uh, I switched myself over to sulfur here. No one wanted to say it would be uh, four and then one half of four. Zero. Sorry about that. I switched myself over to sulfur and didn't think about it. Thanks for pointing that out. Just make that worse than it should be. So, um, Um, what else does it do? Um, the formal charges would actually be negative one half. because it's not really static like we see it there. And those four one halves would act, add up to the negative two. So according to uh, portal charges and electron neutrality, this would be the better structure over here. And uh, I would already have it drawn with the Lewis structure if I was asking you to compare it. And we do something like that. So it's about helping us pick out a better structure. And I'm going to give you something just for practice. Um, it's got four or five problems on it, just strictly on formal charges. It was supposed to be photocopied to this thing, but it wasn't. Record that first one. So 
it'll give you a good idea of what. And you'll see, like in the problem, it asks you which one is more likely, and usually it says right in the problem that you're using formal charges to figure out which one is more likely. And I'll uh, post an answer key for that sometime soon, maybe later today.